This is a Women with Disabilities Victoria podcast. We acknowledge that these podcasts were recorded on the traditional lands of the First Nations people of this country. We acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded and this is and always will be Aboriginal land. From the Outskirts is a series of podcasts featuring women with disabilities who live and work in regional Victoria. I'm Liz Wright, a disability activist and advocate. I'm also the manager of community inclusion and women's empowerment at Women with Disabilities Victoria. All the interviews were recorded in each person's home or workplace, so from time to time there is unexpected background noise. Bernadette Wright has been fighting for the rights of young people and children all her life. From co-parenting her younger siblings, full disclosure, that includes me, to a career working with children and young people as a counsellor and educator, Bern has always had a passion for social justice. Hello, my name is Bernadette Wright. I'm speaking to you from Zha Zha Rung country um, and I acknowledge their elders past and present and want to say that their land was never ceded and it always was and always will be. Hello, Bernadette. It's great to see you today. How are you going? Pretty fine, thank you. That's good. Um, I wanted to talk to you because I think you have some interesting stories to talk about as far as being someone that's lived in rural and regional areas your whole life. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in Bendigo as a young person and moving into adulthood? Well, growing up in Bendigo, a suburb called Kangaroo Flat, yes, Kangaroo Flat, it was pretty idyllic. I loved it. I was I am the I am the eldest of six um, siblings, and although there are only five living, and we had a pretty dream life. We had a creek that we caught tadpoles in and made cubby homes, houses, and um, we had a big neighbourhood of kids and we played on the street and the big kids looked after the little kids and it was pretty lovely. We had a, a mum when we went to school who would pick us up um, in the blue combi and take us out to the bush to pick wildflowers, which you're not meant to do these days, and have picnics after school. It was lovely. Lots of many happy childhood memories, definitely. Would you say you were from a family that uh, had lots of money and resources and stuff or, you know, six kids nowadays is seen to be the sign of, you know, affluence. In our day at Catholic school it, it wasn't really. It was kind of a sign of fertility and... Well, our father was in the army and often the children coincided with mum's pregnancies coincided with when he returned from trips away with the army. So there's, you know, a few age gaps. There's myself, thirteen month, 15 months later, twin boys, then I think four years later, a girl, 13 men- months later, you, four years later, another one. So there was, you know, quite a distance in us. I certainly think we would be, and I consider that we were working class. We lived in an army house that was just newly built when our parents came up from Melbourne with me. Um, No, we certainly, we were working class, but I, I actually liked that. Do you think your childhood and being from a big family shaped you as a person? Of course. I, be- I believe so. I, from a very early age, loved children. I loved all my siblings and I was very, I don't know, responsible and a very hands-on elder sibling. And that was the sort of family we were. We did things mainly with our mum. We made our own fun. Yeah, I think um, for anybody, how their family of origin stuff is does shape you. Well, you know, Bern, I was thinking as the eldest who had a big role in, in mothering some younger children during a time when you were a young person, that's a lot of responsibility that doesn't seem to 
occur so much nowadays, but it was often the role of the oldest child to be, you know, chief bottle washer and cook. It, it was in our case, but I enjoyed it. I mean, at times it could be very frustrating. I don't, with really? Our, with our twin brothers. <laughs> um, and our parents had a, oh, I don't know what sort of relationship you'd say. They seemed to fight a lot and then they, there would be times when they were very close and sometimes as a kid that was quite confusing. So I think in lots of ways I played a role somewhere along the line as helper, supporter, peacemaker, childminder, but I, but I didn't mind it. So why was that confusing for you? Was it because there was conversations between you and our parents or what was confusing about hot and cold with them? Growing up, you know, like it, in, in those days, I think our mother was um, a, a very – clever, clever woman, as was dad, but in the mum had all these kids and she she was intelligent. She read, you know, every night, you know, every Saturday, all the time she was a reader. So I think she was very frustrated having six kids and this brain that was interested in so many things. Um, and so I think we, we were talking about their conflictual relationship at times. Mm, yeah. So there was the element of frustration. Dad would go off to work and sometimes he'd go to the army mess and mum would be furious and he'd always come in the door and say, have I got a story for you more? And that would sort of somehow, you know, break her annoyance and then they'd have a discussion. So sometimes as a kid, and I think for lots of kids, it's confusing when your parents can be seeming at odds and then lovey-dovey, as you would say. Do you think your responsibility and your love of your siblings and, you know, you, you, you have a very strong memory and history of the family has influenced the way you've worked through your careers? Yes, yes, but the way my life has worked out things have been by chance. All my jobs have been by chance. So uh, give me an example. All right. So when I left boarding school. Where was that? North Goulburn, New South Wales. Why were you there from v Bendigo? Well, our great aunt was a Joseph, black Josephite nun and they were at, in those days they were in Tasmania and New South Wales and I used to go to Tassie to visit her with our dad and our grandpa his parents, my grandparents, and um, I loved it. And I went. I was very holy, very holy <laughs> indeed. Yeah. So I had this bit of a thing that I would finish my schooling there. So I ended up in North Goulburn. I couldn't go to Tassie for some reason. I can't remember why. I already had been diagnosed. You know five or six years earlier with my um, eye disease. So what was that? What's it? What's my eye disease is Stargardt's disease. Yep. In those days you didn't have a visiting teacher service or an education support worker. The old name for them was an integration aid to yep. assist children with disabilities. So I was doing, um, in those days it was, you had levels, so if, four first-level subjects and I think it was third-level mathematics. And I left school about three-quarters of the way through year 12, which infuriated our mother immensely because education was everything to her. Mm. And um, Why did was, you leave? Oh, maybe because I was a bit of a snob. I didn't what do you want, mean? What, what do you well, mean by for, that? Sorry. First level is the highest level you could do and I had no real assistance so I couldn't see the board, I couldn't yeah. barely read the textbooks and, you know, the, that became, a, you know, quite hard. So we're talking 70s? Where were we, like what 70, year are we talking? 71 and maybe 
72, yes, 72. Yep. And so when I came home, uh, because mum was so furious, I went to the Blind Institute for I don't know how long, six months or something, which was a very interesting place to be. Did you live in? I lived in and there was no room in the girls' dorm and I was put in the boys' dorm. God. And the first, well, we had a matron. This is what it was like. <laughs> what it, happened? What it happened? It was the old, you know, paternalistic, patriarchal sort of system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that existed, that thankfully the the place doesn't exist anymore. So the first night I came out and there was like a games room and one of the boys said hello and I got reported because I was speaking to a boy and, you know, I, my room was in the boys' area. And so, you had twin brothers. So yeah, you used to talk to boys. But there was boys. sort of no fraternising yeah, uh, yeah. sort of, of a night time. Anyway, in those days you could do switchboard, you know, you could do basket weaving, floristry, things like that. And that was a really... So uh, we're talking sheltered workshop kind of learning. Well, there was a sheltered workshop there. Yeah. But I, I was not part of that. Yeah. And also it was a way of I, I found that people, other residents there, had more sight than me, but because they had been what I would say institutionalised, they they appeared more blind than me. So less capacity, less social kind of admission to a certain extent because they'd been cotton wooled a bit? No, no, so, they were definitely institutionalised, you know, in, in that old sense of... Um, every aspect of their life sort of dictated to. And, you know, we had the nurse there and all that, you know, the staff. And so some people, I guess, uh, just going back a bit, when I lost my most of my sight, there was no discussion. For uh, Mum was so brave because at the INE hospital, there was one particular optometrist actually because because it was seen as very rare in those days. I had, um, when I went there, I saw, you know, there would just be a parade of doctors and optometrists and all that coming through. And there was this one optometrist who kept saying to mum, she needs to go to the blind school. Mum would keep saying, no, she's not. And one day he put on a pair of glasses on mum and she couldn't see anything and she became quite emotional and then, as you know, our mum could be very angry. Mm. She was furious and she said, how dare you treat us like this and I will never set foot here again. And off we marched out of the hospital and didn't go back. I went to see a professor privately after that. But that was really horrific for mum because we never really discussed what I could see and couldn't see and this fellow said that. So when I went to the Blind Institute all those years later, in those days, because of the institutionalisation of people with what I believe of people with disability, and I don't mean that to be offensive to anyone who hears oh, this. Oh, God, we're not going to go into language. <laughs> what do you mean? Like it's okay to say disability. No, I mean I don't want to offend anybody who yeah. went there and had perhaps oh, yeah, a really good experience. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I mean. I mean that you know, life living under that sort of regime d- diminishes you. The hardship that there is when there's kind of a masking level, like a coping level of being very mainstream when you don't have the supports. Like if we think back to 72, 73, even up to, oh, probably not long ago, having to bluff and do everything like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, she's doing it all backwards on he, in, on heels and he's doing it forwards, you know, like it's difficult. So, you know, for you, you've done it hard to a certain extent, like if you don't have the assistance. Well, I did, but I was lucky I was pretty smart. So I did 
I was able to bluff my way through for a long time, but also there was a sense of pride, especially in year 12. And, you know, I did not want to drop levels. So I left. Anyway, getting back to the story. So, yeah. And my career, no one would employ me in when I came home. After that, I went for many jobs. What sort of jobs? Uh, receptionist jobs. Yep. Working in an architect's, um, you know, lot. Uh, applied for whatever I could and people weren't, well, I guess in those days they didn't have any understanding of what I, what a, what a your- person with um, a vision, in, uh, low vision could do mm. and they weren't prepared to give you a chance. So I ended up working as a nurse's assistant at a local aged care facility. Well, that's kind of funny in a way. Which I love. You, you can't be a receptionist but um, you could look after sick sick or potentially yeah. dying and people. I was asked to give insulin shots, <laughs> which I said to, <laughs> to the person who asked me, you know, I can't do that because I can't see it would be really wrong dangerous and they said you could practice on an orange (laughs) so (laughs) I didn't do it so I did that loved that working with the oldies it was quite lovely and then after a few years a mother got sick and I was able to nurse her so that was my first job that I sort of fell into then later on, so a bit of kismet in a way. You might you you could call it that. I, I'm what just, would you say? Oh, I don't know. It's just just the way the, just the way it played out. You know. So you're still very young at this time, though. So how old are you if you're nursing our Mum, mother? Twenty one, and then nearly. And 20. were you married? Yes, I married young. I married at twenty. So you worked as a nurse's assistant. And then your mother got cancer, our mother got cancer, and you nursed her and you were married. Well, what was that period like? And how were you managing that as a really young woman? Or well, couldn't do that? I think, again, it goes back to mum. She was quite extraordinary for her time. She wanted to be at home. She wanted to die at home. I was living in Bendigo and they, you had all moved down to the Bellarine Peninsula, when you love somebody, I could not be parted. So initially when, you know, she first was diagnosed, I um, would go down on weekends and then the the more um, ill she became, I gave up my job and went down and lived with you all, got you kids off to school, looked after mum. Also, to let you know that my dog has just arrived home from a walk and she's panting and and she's not a guard dog, just to let everybody <laughs> know that. She's just an ordinary pet. So so that's what I meant. Mum was quite extraordinary. So if we're talking, this is now 1977 and in those days um, for somebody to want to be at home was unheard of. Everyone, you know died in hospital as far as I knew. Um, so mum chose where she wanted to be buried, you know, so she could overlook the sea one side and um, the rolling hills the other. So from diagnosis till she died was about four months and it was. it's not a sad story. It was a privilege to look after her and that was it. And then what happened for you? As a young woman at, at 21. So I turned 22 after mum died. Oh, and because our dad had been a bit of a wanderer and away a lot in their marriage, you know, he went away to Vietnam for um, a year, which nearly broke their marriage up because mum took all you young children down to the moratoriums protesting against the Vietnam War yeah, yeah. and used to stick stickers on Dad's car to, that he drove to the army a big, it stopped the war and he'd take them off because you're not allowed to do that in the army. No. Not allowed to have a political view. So because he'd been away 
well, through a lot of their marriage, six months at a time, 12 months at a time, lots of six months at a time. Um, Mum was very worried about the young youngest in the family. So she and Dad asked myself and my then husband if you girls, my, you and um, two other siblings, could live with us. And of course, we said yes. And that January, you all came up to live with us in Bendigo. What was that like as a young couple with a second family and a baby on the way? Oh, yes, I forgot to say that. Then I you were found pregnant. out that I was pregnant. Well, because I like living with family, it wasn't easy because we didn't have much money, but it was easy in so many other ways. It was um, and hard at times. I think the hardest thing for me was that because we were young, when you all went to school, all your friends' parents were way older than us and and I, I think I, I, Judgy. Felt, I felt judged. They were like, you know, what what would you know about raising teenagers? Well, Which I was think. kind of hilarious because you two were the strictest parents, stricter than my own parents. Yes, because you were all little buggers. Well, no, we were just really smart. <laughs> at escaping and doing stuff but all those older parents were so judgy and it was unbelievable in that time our youngest sibling came up to me and was she did grade six through to year 12 you did year nine year 10 year 10 through year 12 but went over over as an exchange student yeah and then our other sister did year 10 through year 12. Year 11 and 12. Yes. So as each of you, I mean, you know, I did parenting groups and things like that to try and be always a better parent, but there, there are things you, you, you wouldn't do now. In hindsight, it's a wonderful thing. Like you know, block someone from seeing Bette Midler. No, I'm not entering into that, Elizabeth. This is my interview. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I think, you know, one thing, I mean, you know, because hindsight is a wonderful thing, you know, I thought that everybody, you know, left home at 18 and went to uni and that sort of thing. And in hindsight, I would never, I would have said stay as long as you like. And by that stage we were be, we were becoming more financially you know, my, my the 80s. husband was starting his own business and so, yeah. Lots of people in the 80s made money and it was a very different time. Like the 70s seemed more like. This was the middle 70s. So that, that was it and then I fell into some other jobs. So what other jobs? I um, did some work for, we had an organisation called St Luke's, which is now Anglicare. And I was a family group home person. We would go in and when the group home leaders had holidays and things like that, so relief, we did the relief work. Then I worked in an early adolescent unit, always with young people. Then I was approached to go and work in community health. So I went out there and I spent 10 years out there. And what did that involve? Well, it started off as being a family support worker, so you would go into people's homes and support them in their goals for what they wanted to change and improve or do it with their families. And then we had referrals for young people, so I would go to their schools and see them at their schools. So working with young people, I then did... Um, an advanced diploma in clinical hypnosis and psychotherapy, which was great. I really enjoyed that. What is it that you love about working with young people? I think that young people often are treated in the most patronising mm. way. Agree, yeah. And I think if we give them space and honour their, in, their integrity and their intelligence, you can have the most amazing discussions. I still meet people that I had from working in a different job in schools, now some of them in their 30s, which makes me feel just 
Oh, <laughs> God, so old. Yeah. And it's just like we were talking so all what, those years ago. Yeah, so what was that work? So that was another job. So I left community health and then I was yeah. approached by an agency in town which was called Ease, which was a domestic violence agency, and they wanted to do a program um, of violence prevention for young uh, children at school up to year seven. And they sort of said, would I come on and be like an advisor? So they employed someone else and that person couldn't cope, well, found it very hard in the classroom. So after three weeks I had to go in and that was my first experience of whole classrooms. And so how does that go with you and eyesight stuff in a classroom of 20-plus kids? Well, sometimes 28. I was terrified. I just thought, how on earth can I do it? I mean, but then... I don't know, I'm probably bossy or something, I don't know. Um, th- mm. But I guess I learned fairly quickly and banged on about respect and so and and also the kids loved it. It was just fabulous. So that's how I ended up running and developing a program. So Which was called? Uh, it was called Solving the Jigsaw. So how did you develop it? Because the other the person who was employed to do it, write it and do it, left, you know, I got together with the then manager and... Said I can do it. Well, no, I just, I don't know, I had to do it. So, um, and I had lots of ideas about how to do it. So it was a program that evolved until till I left working in schools um, a year and three quarters ago. I still practice that same philosophy in the classroom. It's just an amazing way of working with young people. Well, you have to talk about this t- to us because how is it, how do you work with, how does it work? Well, it gives children a voice from prep or I believe even pre-prep, kinder. Yeah. Kids should be doing these sort of programs where they get to listen and hear other people feel and show compassion explore the issues of the world in a very respectful way that sometimes even means exploring their own lives and also building their skill base as well to be able to speak up, to not tolerate abuse of any sort, to understand the concept of consent and things like that. It was pretty yeah. amazing. Oh, it was of, very before its time. Yeah. I think that in education uh, programs come and go and depending on, you know, who picks, you know, who in the high, the echelons of the departments of education pick them up or take, you know, they, they take their fancy, it's what's in and what what's out, out and what, yeah. sometimes what's, you know, current overseas as well. But I do believe in that way of working. Well, I always do. I have a private practice, small private practice for counselling and that's just the way that I operate. So you finished working in the education system and now you're in a different chapter of your life. What's your what are your big passions right now? <laughs> so I'm just going to go back one <laughs> bit <laughs> to working with people and say that our mother was very politically active and I guess for me that has informed a lot of well all our all our lives in in mm. our family. Mm. So for me, the rights of children, the rights of people with disability, refugees, Indigenous, our Indigenous First Nations people, my God, hearing that boyish speech the other oh that was fantastic. Which speech? Um, Noel Pearson doing the boyish speech. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was remarkable. So the so social justice is, I guess, very important to me, really important. So how many children do you have, Benedict? I have three. And are you a traveller? I have travelled. I would love to travel more. Um, in recent years, because of having um, very low vision, 
and uh, you know I walked for many many years in the in the mornings for an hour every morning and had some pretty spectacular tumbles <laughs> um, and so I've had two knee replacements so I'm building my strength I would like to travel again you know I've been to places Italy I loved France um, been to Geneva, New York, you know, there's many places yeah. there I haven't been, but um, I do like travel. I like the experience of being in places where people walked thousands, you know, yeah, years ago. Of course, of course. And yeah. uh, my youngest daughter and I are talking about going to the Northern Territory. I really want to go there. You have a social justice background, but you're also a serial writer to the local Bendigo advertiser. I used to be. I haven't written many lately. I'm too angry to write at the minute. <laughs> but uh, were you writing about political issues or what, what was what was the the gist of the or the breadth of your writing over I've that time? I've had some funny letters, so... Um, because I feel very strongly about um, family and domestic violence. I remember <laughs> I commented on an article uh, once with, that caused a bit of a storm. I wrote a, a, a big response to a quote from someone from my former workplace which elicited a response where they said I was being mischievous which what? was not my intention at all. I just really believed that. I believe that often in in the world of um, uh, community services and government agencies, we talk about we used to talk about unit cost funding, and I think that we need to always be mindful of people, mm. talking about people and things like that. So, uh, so that created a bit of a storm. I have written on a local community pool. I've written at times of elections. I do like a bit of a letter. <laughs> oh, do you think it's um, but I'm not familial doing it at the minute. or hereditary? Oh, yeah, because um, our mother <laughs> <laughs> was very political and actually she was pretty amazing because she was the first woman, well, we were raised Catholic and there was a co-op and mum was the first woman director of that co-op. Then she joined a political party. What was the co-op? St Mary's Co-op. It was a cooperative where it was like a bank where people paid in money and then your bills were paid. So that started way back, way, way back. And then mum joined a political party, the Labor Party. It was the 1972 election. She and other Catholic members of the Labor Party wrote an open letter to the Bishop of Bendigo, the Catholic Bishop of Bendigo, and that was even um, documented in a book that one of us has got somewhere in our treasure trove of family history. So, yeah, Mum was part of, uh, was a signatory to that letter of calling on the Bishop to not get involved in politics. Because they were preaching from the pulpit to vote DRP. They, yes, not to vote for the Labor Party. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, and also I love the written word, you know. I, I, what I, do you like to read, Burn? Well, the reading thing is a bit interesting because the journey through my loss of vision has been I could read print and then I could only read large print then I couldn't read that, so I've gone to audio books. But I love the printed word and I think as a person of my uh, uh, ageing person, it's absolutely true that the less you see in print, your word usage goes down. Oh, yeah, I have and to ask. And your spelling goes down. Oh, no, down. no, really down because I have to ask people all the time, how do you spell that, how yeah. do you spell that? And I was brainy, like I was very English literate as far as spelling, grammar, all of that stuff. Yeah. I remember in, I think it was great, it was grade two, it wasn't grade one even though I could read. I had a reading in those days, I had a reading age of 15 point something and I used to do the dictation and correct it. 
And same with me in my year. For the for the teachers, for the nuns. So. Yes, they would give me the same thing. They mm. would give me, here, you correct all of this. Yeah. And I just sit up the back mm. going, nah, nah, <laughs> nah. Yeah, letter just going back to letter writing, I, I like that and I and I like a cause. With audio books, even though you, you can get some wonderful narrators, to me there's no comparison to actually seeing the written word. When you I believe when you see the written word, you then it happens in your brain. The, the context of it, you make what you want of it, whereas when someone's narrating, you have all their nuances and the, the tone that they read it, the inflection, their interpretation. And even though, you know, that that's what you live with and often they're quite lovely, I would prefer to be able to see it myself. So do you think I you, miss it? Yeah, so do you think you will ever... Get over that. No. So that would be a grief for you forever. It's not grief in the, you know, like if we had it on a scale, a catastrophe scale, it's not way up there, but it is a, it is a sadness, a, a, an annoyance because I do love the written word and I, and I think if I could see the written word and it wasn't so bloody hard, you know, with enlarging and all that sort of stuff, even when, you know, I'm doing emails and things like that, you know, I wonder what I could achieve. I wonder the possibilities, the what, what difference I could make in the world. At my age now, you know, I would have to say I am the most disheartened I've ever been in my life. I think our treatment of First Nations people is appalling. I think the game that is played by politicians and having grown up in a very staunch, you know, a, a, the for example, the Labor Party that lies to the roots of who I am, what I grew up with, mm. where I believe the seeds of social justice were perhaps sown. And also, you know, as kids, we, you know, we we never watched much commercial TV. We watched things like Four Corners, Monday Conference, This Day Tonight. This Day Tonight, yeah. We watched everything political. We grew up in it. It's in our blood. And I think there's a lack of commitment to long-term planning and policy. It's now I think things run on election cycles. So I think that the tax system is unequal. I think that people are living in poverty and they are, they absolutely are, is a travesty in our country. Mm. I think that the way we treat our migrants is appalling. You know, those sort of things I find, like if, if, if I was wanting to write a letter to the editor at the moment, it would be an absolute rant. It would be 20 pages long. So I'm not doing that. So um, I, I think a lot of that goes back to our roots. I'm very big on that. But do you think it was grassroots Labor Party stuff in a regional area or do you think it was broader than that? Broader than that because um, our, our mother went, you know, was just not regional. She, you know, went more central, I suppose. For, so for me, I, I just think we've lost the plot and we don't actually care you know, there there will always be people we need to take care of. That's just the truth of it. There will always be generational poverty. There will always be, you know, people with disability and they should never be compromised, I, I don't believe. But anyway, that's just me having a bit of a rant. Although I have just given a big rant about how disheartened I am, I want to say that I think 
life or my life has so much, I think there is joy in the world, I think. And, you know, if we say climate change um, and where I live we've had a lot of rain, but the joy for me of that is um, my garden <laughs> is has gone berserk and that's not taking away from the flooding that's happening and that's not even reported. But anyway, I wanted to say that people are amazing to engage with uh, people to have a conversation. I'm doing a new job at the moment that I fell into. What's that job? Bert? Which is a retail assistant. Now I was abs. Every job I've ever done, I've been terrified about because I like to do things perfectly. That's my big hook in life. So when I was asked to help a friend out in retail. I thought, oh, bloody hell, I could only think about everything possibly that I could not do. Anyway, I'm doing it, working in retail with an FPOS machine and a till and price tags and all sorts of things. But, you know, you meet people and you connect and you have conversation and that's wonderful. And for me, that's the joy of life. That That is the joy you know, notwithstanding my, my gorgeous children and extended family and the the many loves that I have um, with family and friends and, you know, I think <laughs> for me, even though I spend my time, much of my time enraged about what's happening in the world and especially what's happening for people with disability at the moment, there's joy. What rails you about people with disability at the moment? What's what's, what's Well, I your... am so utterly, you know, we've just had the budget and, you know, for many of the news bulletins, because I listened to the news, the first thing that came up was the blowout in the NDIS and, you know, I, I feel outraged about that. I absolutely feel outraged about that and I think it's unfair and I think if that's, you know, it, it, it is not the people with disability who are rorting the system. So it's the overinflation of prices the, and um, that service providers are now being given liberty to use. It's the rorting of the system. Yeah. And also as a person, you know, I I have a very modest NDIS plan, I, I believe, very modest, and I was in review for three years before I went to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Now, this is where the rorting is happening. For me to get two pieces of assistive technology, took two solicitors uh, from the NDIS against me and the registrar, from the tribunal, I think there was another person. That's such a rort for such a small you piece know, of. There, and there's so much wrong with that system. The theory behind it is so fantastic and so, I'll use their words, reasonable and necessary. But value and, but for if, money. But if in, this, in the washout of this, because of, you know, it's blown out of its budget, if the washout is that the people who bear the brunt of the responsibility are the people with disability, that is outrageous and that's what I'm fearful of. Yeah. Ditto. On that point, Bernadette, I'd like to thank you so much for being part of this um, series of podcasts. It's been really enjoyable and interesting hearing about your life and what you do. Thank you. Thank you. To find out more about Women with Disabilities Victoria, go to wdv.org.au.